Dr. Brown, you were not born a Muslim. How did you become one? How many times have been asked that question? <laughs> I used to have some kind of card printed out that I can give people. Uh, I mean, it's not anyone's fault for asking the question. So I try to, whenever I get asked that, I try to, I try to answer it in a, with as good a humor as possible. I'm not trying to avoid answering the question, but it's, it's, it's actually interesting because, you know, I've been Muslim now for about 21 years. So I was 19, I think, when I became Muslim. And so I'm 41 now. You know, I've been Muslim longer than I was not Muslim, which is kind of interesting. Um, looking back, like what it means or sort of how I think about it, it's very different now than it was maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Or To answer the question, I almost have to like put myself back into the particular mindset I was in at the time, which mm. is different from me now. I mean, mm-hmm. it's different thinking about religion and what it means to you as a parent and, you know, as a, someone who's has a family and has children and thinks about communal leadership and versus when you're sort of an unattached 19 year old who's sort of this like disembodied brain that's just floating around the universe uh-huh. I was raised Episcopalian but my family background was uh, a little bit unusual my mom I think she was an agnostic I mean she sometimes said she was an atheist but usually if she had like a glass of wine or two you could have a pretty good discussion about God with her and she'd eventually accept the existence of a divine omnipotent being hmm. My father was raised Episcopalian. His mother was sort of very proper wasp woman. Her, fa- her She actually came from a very prominent Cleveland family, i.e. as in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm-hmm. But they had uh, lost all their money during the Great Depression, although not because of the Depression. They got swindled out of it by their accountant or something like that. But, I mean, so she went from being extremely rich when she was growing up to being very poor. Uh-huh. And so that was very traumatic for her. But she was very kind of pr- priss and proper Episcopalian woman. And so she raised my father, uh, Episcopalian, although my father's dad, and this, I didn't know this until I was an adult, until I was in my 20s, I actually didn't know that he was uh, Jewish. He grew up an uh, Orthodox Jew, mm-hmm. and he and his siblings changed their names and uh, they completely abandoned their religion and their background. I mean, I just assumed he was Episcopalian like my dad, but he was sort of like, didn't talk about religion. Mm. Um, so anyway, dad was raised Episcopalian. And he was pretty, um, not really sure what religion meant to him, even later on in life. He didn't really talk about it. But he took us to church every Sunday, and we were acolytes. Me and my sisters were acolytes. So, in fact, I went all the way up the sort of course sonorum of the acolyte guild or whatever, and I, I you know, would help the minister with the communion and everything. Mm-hmm. But it was weird because, and I was confirmed and everything, but to be honest, I, <laughs> I feel bad. I hope my you know old Sunday school teachers don't hear this, but... <laughs> I don't think I really understood anything about my religion. <laughs> I didn't understand anything about Christianity uh-huh. at all. You know, I remember it was in my 20s, and I wa- re-watched Ben-Hur. Yeah. And I was like, this actually explains Christianity to me, to me a lot better than uh, my Sunday school. Huh. I was like, hey, I finally get it, you know? Huh. <laughs> I finally get this. So I, I think I just had very little kind of intellectual relationship with my religion. I had very little even spiritual relationship with my religion. I had very little communal relationship because Mm. although we went to Sunday school and church every weekend, no one ever mentioned God in our house. Mm. It never came up. It was a zero part of our life except for that one time on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we had no kind of community based around that. But I, I was very religious. I mean, I really believed in God. I had very strong feelings about kind of metaphysical anxiety and kind of longing for a connection to something bigger and greater and, re- and more real. Mm-hmm. And so I believed in God, but I didn't really understand anything else. And later on in my life, when I went to high school, my dad sent me to boarding school to build character. I went to a school in California called Thatcher, which is a very good school. That's where Howard Hughes went. I don't know if that makes any huh. difference or not, but... Uh, yeah, so I went there for high school, and that was sort of in the foothills of these mountains in California, and Southern California, and I would uh, go out a lot into the mountains behind the school in the afternoons and just walk around and run, and uh, I just remember being very close to nature and feeling this connection to something bigger than me, than myself, and uh, longing for that, and longing for more of that, and longing to have answers to questions about you know what the meaning of my life was, what, what would happen when I died, you know, what would my life amount to? How would I have any meaning in the universe Mm -hmm. if my life was just of no significance in this great cosmic process? And uh, in high school, I was just very kind of, I would just say I had immense metaphysical anxiety, Mm. you know, maybe more than the average teenager. I was really kind of almost debilitated by it. 
but I didn't at all look, interestingly, I didn't at all look into my own Christian tradition for answers to that. I think part of that was because I was in California. I was in the schools in this valley called Ojai Valley, O-J-A-I, mm-hmm. which um, is famous for being, as far as I know, one of the few east-west valleys. So it's like a big kind of, I don't even know, Krishnamurta sort of crystal power. Okay. It's a popular new age location. Yeah. There's a lot of kind of spaces and places that are around that kind of thinking. Um, it's also featured in the Steven Seagal film, Hard to Kill, which some of your listeners might appreciate or probably <laughs> not, but I certainly like the movie. <laughs> kind of really was a thinking more things more in a, I don't want to use sort of almost a cliche term, a kind of an Eastern religions way of uh, Taoism and, mm-hmm. um, and things like that. It's interesting to me that I didn't at all uh, think about answering these questions in, in the, the vocabulary that had been presented to me as, as a child. Mm-hmm. I think that maybe is a function of where I was and also a function of just, I think, generally a kind of upper middle class, liberal American mistrust of kind of, quote unquote, orthodox, you know, or organized religion or, mm-hmm. or Christianity. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's hard for me to talk about this because I don't bear any, I, I bear no ill will towards that tradition at all, towards Christianity at all. In fact, it's kind of awkward because I, I mean, I have such great relationships with my Christian colleagues uh, at Georgetown and just generally with, I feel great affinity and, and fraternity with people of faith, Christians and Jews, uh, especially, you know, um, I don't want my life to be in any way kind of this story of moving, you know, leaving behind one flawed tradition and going to the, to a, to a better one. I don't, I mean, I guess it's sort of hard not to read that into my life, but I don't want to, that's not how I want to present it to people. I don't want to in any way denigrate or, or um, critique other people's religious traditions. So anyway, but I mean, then I, uh, when I went to college, my brain was just kind of humming on this these issues, and I was really eager to engage them. And so I took, I actually went to Georgetown for undergraduate, and then I took a class on biblical literature. I'm still friends with the professor who taught it. He's my, my, now my colleague. And uh, yeah, I guess I, that didn't really uh, make me any more interested in being Christian. And then I took a class on Islam for my second theology requirement. I just chose that randomly, and that was that was it. I just was so interested, and I just this seemed to me to be the religion that I had always been that I had always believed in, hmm. and that was it. So it seemed to have some things that uh, the religion of your youth was lacking, something that would soothe that existential angst that you were referring to. I mean, I don't really, it's, again, it's kind of hard to tell because, it, you know, it's like someone saying, you know, you, you were raised your whole life eating bad chili or something, and then you went to a really good Chinese restaurant, and, you know, you're like, oh, Chinese food is what I want to eat for the rest of my life. Well, I mean, yeah, but you could also have liked good chili if you hadn't been eating bad chili. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I think that, that's a weird analogy, but I mean, I think that it's hard for me to say this because I, you know, I am Muslim and I believe my religion is the tr- true faith, but. I, I recognize that it would have been it would it was simply a matter of contingency or luck or whatever fate that uh, I didn't find that nourishment in my own tradition because I think had I been around different people or different influences that that would have been very easy I think I easily could have found the same soothing or the same answers that I found as a Muslim. Mm-hmm. So speaking of things that you have affinities to, I noticed in your book, Miss Cody Muhammad, that there was a lot of interesting information about recent Islamic thinkers in Egypt. Do you have some particular mm. connection with Egypt? Well, part of it is that, you know, you could look at, if you think about kind of Islamic thought in the 19th and 20th centuries, 21st centuries, um, there's two real centers uh, in terms of kind of dynamic engagement with modernity, with the West. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is um, India, British India, mm-hmm. and the second one is is Egypt. Uh, so Egypt is really just sort of a kind of crucible of a lot of this thought and expression, and some of the biggest scholars come out of there, Muslim scholars. So I think that's one of the reasons. And the second is during my time in graduate school, and then after graduate school, I spent a lot of time first learning Arabic there, then studying with traditional Muslim scholars, uh, Islamic law and theology and Hadith. And it was the world I knew the best so that was why. 